Welcome to 2020. This is the traditional time of year for a retrospective. I'm almost two years in and I still feel like a beginner. Astrophotography is the hardest kind of photography that I've ever done, and the learning curve has been steep. Almost every image has presented its own set of challenges, and it would be easy to be discouraged. Instead, I thought it might be useful to look back over the last 21 months and see how things have changed, hopefully for the better. In this video, we're going to look at my first nine months of images, starting in March 2018. A follow-up video will look at 2019. All of the images featured in this video are one-shot color, either from a Canon DSLR or an ASI-294. This was my first image that used both a tracking mount and stacking. I had been fortunate enough to do two solar and one lunar eclipse, and I had done one experiment with untracked stacking, but this was a big step up in complexity. I was new to German equatorial mounts, I was new to astrophotography, I had long been involved in amateur astronomy and photography, but aside from a few eclipses, this is the first time I had tried to put the two hobbies together. The goal was to get a couple of hours on Orion, and then maybe a couple more on the Pleiades. Exactly how long would depend on both how long the camera batteries and I lasted and temperatures that started just above freezing and were expected to go down from there. I traveled to a club site that was about half an hour drive from my house because it had much better horizons than my backyard. It was also slightly darker, around a border zone darker. It took me at least an hour to get to the point of taking my first image. I don't recall exactly what problems I faced, I think the biggest one was plate solving, but there may have been more. I recall finding Pole Master to be a bit fiddly. Ultimately, I turned off plate solving and verified that the entire constellation was visible in the frame, though just barely. That turned out to be a bad choice. Less than half an hour later, I was done for the night. The camera batteries had died. I had an external grip on the camera that allowed for two batteries, and I had hoped that would get me at least a few hours in the cold but it turned out to be 90 minutes, more than 60 of which were spent fighting with equipment. I did have two more batteries, but at that point I was cold and moderately frustrated. I packed up and decided to head home. Despite the setbacks, I was excited to see what I got. As I had watched the images come into SGP, I expected to see M42, but I wasn't expecting to see the horse head in flame. They were faint, but there. It was exciting enough to keep the cold at bay while the camera was working. I was looking forward to seeing what stacking would produce. I had planned to take dark frames at the site, but the early battery death put an end to that. I took dark and bias frames outside at home the next day and attempted to use my computer monitor for flats. I used the batch preprocessing script in PixInsight and produced my integrated master. PixInsight workflow was still pretty hazy in my brain, so I used a YouTube video on DSLR processing to guide me. When I was done muddling my way through PixInsight, this was the result. I was pleased that several of the nebula in Orion were visible, but not so pleased about the reddish edges of stars. Also, away from the center, the stars got pretty elongated. I knew a zoom lens was not the best choice, but at that focal length, a zoom was my only choice. I had hoped for better, but astrophotography brutally reveals the limits of the optics. There was the light-colored arc running through the bottom of the image. What was it? It looked like it was the right spot to be Barnard's loop, but that ought to be red, and this was white. I assumed it was some sort of lens flare artifact, but wasn't sure. So there's a lot wrong with this image. The framing put part of the subject too close to the edge of the frame. My subject was actually barely within the frame. That left me with little choice in how to crop the image. Because of the framing issue, the stars are the worst and the part of the image I care about the most. My flats overcorrected the image. I didn't realize until putting together this retrospective that I took my flats at the wrong f-stop, f3.2 instead of f4. At the time, I didn't know what was causing the arc, but going back and looking at the raw integration, 
there's some really odd stuff going on the edges of the frame. By coincidence, the part that stayed in the image, thanks to the bad framing, was trying its best Barnard's loop impression, but it really is an artifact, but from the flats, not from the lens flare. I didn't understand any of the Pix Insight tools well, and was essentially flailing whenever I had to go off script. I got a result, and one that I was very excited about at the time, but that doesn't make it any less cringeworthy in absolute terms. I've seen worse verse images, but I've also seen many that are a lot better. But after wanting to do astrophotography for longer than I'd care to admit, the journey had finally begun. I decided to stick to home for the time being, given how much difficulty I had the first time out. This time I decided for M45 and used a focal length of 200 millimeters. I also used a slightly smaller f-stop in the hopes that the corners of the frame would be better. I was still operating from battery power, and again the camera died after an hour, but even if it had lasted longer it wouldn't have helped. M45 began setting behind the neighbor's house 50 minutes in, which is why the number of frames is so small. On the plus side, I did get plate solving to work. On the downside, my focus is a bit off. Also, the stars tend to elongate toward the corners, though the worst of that is cropped out thanks to having the target centered. So, while longer focal length helped, it didn't solve the problem. My flat exposures are still far too short and are still overcorrecting. The only thing that saved me was that the edges are cropped out. My Pix Insight processing is still pretty heavy-handed. I now had external power for the camera and was able to get images over two rare clear nights, but those nights were on a nearly full moon. It had been nearly two months since a clear night though, so I set up and imaged. The window of opportunity for M81 and M82 was fairly short given the high tree line, but I managed a bit more than three hours of usable frames. This time I overexposed my flats and ended up not using them. For some reason the mechanics of capturing flat frames was eluding me. The focus is a little better, but given that this is the same lens, it has the same optical aberrations as the M45 image. On the plus side, you can see a little detail in the galaxies and that was exciting, but the targets were too small for that focal length. My processing still isn't great. I left in a green cast that should have been removed. I bought the Stellar View OTA at Neef in April, but this was the first clear night that I could try it. When I went looking for targets visible from home, I opted for M57 because it was bright even though it was small. It's much too small for my 480mm focal length, but this was really more of a test than an effort for an image. I expected problems since it was my first attempt at guiding, and I definitely got them. I had a terrible time getting a good calibration out of PhD. My guiding RMS was quite poor, and I spent at least three hours trying to get it to cooperate without success. My guiding sucked. It all started with a failure to get enough south movement to get a good calibration. It was the beginning of a problem that would be the bane of my existence. I didn't even bother with calibration frames. I wasn't expecting to get anything usable, so I didn't think it was worthwhile. I focused manually and didn't yet have a batten off mask. I was close, but not perfect, and I didn't check focus as the temperature dropped. On the positive side, M57 has such high surface brightness that the small number of frames I was able to get did make it possible to get an image out of it. And since the interesting part of the frame was so small and in the center, the lack of flats didn't hurt much. Of course, I couldn't crop this tightly without the image looking pixelated, but I liked the look of the isolated planetary nebula sitting out there in space. I had become convinced that my guiding issues were caused by my DSLR, really the DSLR cables. In retrospect, this was a bad conclusion, but I was desperate to solve the problem, and I wanted to have a cooled camera. I had originally intended to go straight to mono imaging, but convinced myself that a one-shot color cooled camera would be useful. The cooled camera was definitely useful, but it didn't solve the guiding problems. My flats are exposed better, but they don't look right when stretched. They actually look too flat. This caused problems for calibration that showed up as a brownish halo. My guiding is still terrible. I'm getting good subs, but I'm throwing away a lot. I'm manually focusing, and I'm not checking during the night to see how focus is drifting. I had believed the small refractor would hold focus pretty well, and perhaps it does compared to a large refractor, but it still shifts as the night cools. I was also using an LED tracing panel for flats. The panel wasn't very evenly illuminated, 
but by rotating the panel on the telescope every few seconds, I could average that out when the flats were integrated. Not an ideal solution, but it did work. I'm finally getting flats that look like flats should look. The gradients in this image were hard to deal with. The weather had been so bad that I took this clear night even though it was only three days before full moon. Since the entire image is basically nebulosity, it is hard to use the background modelization tools without damaging the image. I tried though, and this was my result. There is this brownish cast in the upper and lower left, and I think that's still light pollution, but I'm not certain. It still might be a flats issue. I also am still overexposing my frames. At gain 200, 60 seconds is too long in my Bortal 7 sky. I'm still struggling with Pix Insight, and it's the process of stretching that's giving me the most difficulty. I'm finding it hard to stretch without causing problems along the way. Sometimes things just go off the rails. In my quest to bring out Pickering's triangle in the center of the image, I went overboard in processing. My stars greatly suffered, plus there was color blotchiness in the background. Of course, the guiding woes are still continuing. It all starts with exposures that are far too long for the gain, but that really isn't getting my attention yet. This image is objectively terrible, though when I said that to a friend who was a non-imager, he accused me of having imposter syndrome. He's wrong. It's a bad image. The guiding problems were still continuing, so to combat them I went to 15 second exposures and stopped guiding. That helped get more good frames, but now the frames are underexposed. I'm also experiencing image drift throughout the night. That led to a final integration that made it harder to crop because the area with edge artifacts was now much larger. Even so, this is one of my better images to date. The biggest challenge was stretching the image because it brought out this blotchy color in the background. So that's a summary of a not very good first year. My exposures were all over the map. Although I came into this thinking I had a good understanding of how everything worked, the sheer complexity threatened to overwhelm me. I had so many other problems that optimal exposures were way down on the list to figure out. I don't think I managed to get one decent flat. My mount was not cooperating, and to add insult to injury, the weather was constantly cloudy. We averaged about one clear night a month and had twice as much rain as we normally get. Despite that, I was seeing some progress, or at least I was learning a lot from each image. It wasn't necessarily showing up in these images, but each image taught me something. There was a small part of me that wanted to give up, throw in the towel, and admit that astrophotography was just too hard for me. Fortunately, I'm stubborn. In the next video, we'll look at what happened in 2019.